You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech, the Future Tech Health Podcast. I have uh, Rano Goudreau. He's an entrepreneur, speaker, investor, and the CEO of Behavioral Signals, the enterprise software company that delivers uh, an emotion AI engine that uh, introduces uh, emotional intelligence into speech recognition technology. And Rano has been awarded the Entrepreneur of the Month by CIO Magazine and U.S. China Pioneer Award by IEIE. He's been listed amongst the top 10 entrepreneurs to follow uh, in 2017 by the Huffington Post. He's been a featured speaker at the World Government Summit in Dubai, Silicon Valley Smart Future Summit, and the IEIE in New York, a contributing columnist for TechCrunch and Forbes. So uh, great to have you. I appreciate it, Brenna. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Richard. Uh, that's quite an introduction. I appreciate it. And uh, it's a sincere pleasure to be uh, part of this. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I think I need to work on my personal credentials because that was such a good one, but uh, good for you. Uh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so tell me about the, um, why create um, an emotional or an AI that understands emotional context of what you say? I mean, it's probably obvious, but, but tell me how you came to this realization. You know, um, that's a really powerful question. I, I, I don't think I've been asked that many, uh, many times often, which is why do this and why create uh, an emotion AI? Um, what, what I want to do is I want to answer this by uh, quoting um, one of the legends in the space of AI, one of the founding fathers of AI, Marvin Minsky, because he was once asked about machine emotions and he, he said, uh, the question is not whether intelligent machines can have any emotions, but whether machines can be intelligent without any emotions. And so I, I personally feel that it is it is an essential piece of um, artificial intelligence in general, but is an, also an essential piece of voice interactions. And, you know, we should talk a little bit more about voice interactions. I know you have a specific interest in that area. It's an area that has fascinated the field of AI uh, over the last uh, decade or so. But if you think about sort of how things have progressed, just uh, just a few years ago, and I'd say, you know, not so not too far back, maybe five to seven years ago, um, aspects such as NLP uh, were considered cutting edge. This is this was uh, experimental and bleeding edge stuff. Fast forward into 2019 today, NLP or you know, just sort of uh, the part of uh, what is being said and translating the, word, uh, the actual speech into words accurately is state of the art. Uh, it's it's uh, it's as accurate as it, as it needs to be. It's even more accurate than uh, potentially a human can uh, achieve. And so with that, and if you consider interacting through voice is the most fundamental intrinsic part of, uh, it's, like, it's almost like an innate human reaction. So a baby baby can uh, communicate through voice, and even though there's still language barriers, they don't understand uh, how to say such words, and an adult can understand a baby. And that's why voice is so powerful, and that's why voice is even more powerful than, say, touch, in terms of how we want to interact with other people or devices or for whatever. But if you, thought, if you think about voice interaction, um, 
the one of the fundamental aspects of voice is or interactions itself is is communicating intent or if me if I'm listening to you as another human uh, trying to you know connect with you and relate with you and understand your state of the mind uh, that's what makes those conversations more real not just not just what you're saying, uh, but how you're saying it, or not just what I'm saying and how I'm saying it. So it's the combination of what plus how that makes that conversation uh, impactful, real, and meaningful. And I think that's been missing. That's been missing, um, you know, for a long time. And a lot of uh, progress has been made on voice interactions and other aspects of AI, but emotion diluted that whole uh, equation and that's where we add value and we uh, you know we're looking to fill in that gap not just from a perspective of a specific kpis into certain verticals but in general so i think um, yeah. you know i think it's uh, it's a phenomenal opportunity and i love that we're uh, we're playing in that uh, space and we're leading that charge well yeah i was thinking a few things as you were talking so Mm -hmm. um, some people, or a lot of people, I think, you know, they, through email, they always say, oh, you can't feel the emotional content of something, and, and through text, certainly, so things get misinterpreted a lot. Things could feel harsh by what someone says in a text or an email, and maybe they don't mean that at all, so I'm sure it's led to countless misunderstandings. And then um, I think about also uh, the different types of learners, you know, auditory, kinesthetic, mm -hmm. visual, and a lot of the world's geared towards visual learners, but uh, there are people that are very auditory like me and many others. And, you know, you want to hear, like you said, people's voices and how things sound instead of just the uh, the text version of it. So I definitely agree that there's a lot uh, to be desired in this arena, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, let me add one more thing to what you just said. The question is why voice, right? So I think that's a question we do get asked a lot, which is great. Emotion AI sounds fascinating, but why voice? Um, you know, why, because there's, there's, there's other, other ways we communicate emotions. Uh, we communicate emotions through facial expressions, through body language, through, uh, other potential means of, uh, you know, uh, communicating intent. But the question why voice is a powerful question. And, um, according to a recent Yale study, our sense of hearing may be even stronger than sight when it comes to accurately detecting emotions. So what that means is, I mean, we become more accurate when we hear someone's voice than when we look only at their facial expressions or see their face and hear their voice. And this was a study which was recently done by Michael Cross, a uh, Yale University uh, psychologist, and he he tested he tested this very simple hypothesis. He basically took a took a, a video file um, where there's audio and video, and he turned the video off. And he he tried to measure emotion simply on the audio, and he benchmarked it, and he gave it a score. Then he turned the video on with the expectation that um, now that you have additional clues, you have the audio, but you now also have the visual clues because you can look at the facial expressions. And, and let's tune into those attributes as well. The, the actual read of emotion should go higher. But what he discovered is that actually it went down, and that was very intriguing. So that kind of led to the study. And um, what the reason why that happens is we as humans are actually fairly adept in masking our emotions through our facial expressions. Um, I mean, we, we've been taught to look a certain way and act a certain way. And, you know, the more evolved of us, uh, especially the corporate, we can also we can also manage our body language well. But we are we suck at masking our emotions through our voice. And, I mean, the way I feel and how I feel comes through my voice and, and intonation, uh, no matter how high a heart I try to hide it. And this was the discovery. And for us, um, that's a resounding, uh, you know, validation because uh, we, we knew this on day one. Uh, our founders have done a lot of research in this area in behavioral science and emotion. And we bet on voice, and we bet on voice, and it turned out to be that uh, voice only is vast, uh, vastly superior to voice plus visual, uh, or visual only. And so, um, you know, that again brings a lot more credit to uh, emotions and the role it plays into voice interactions, and the way a role voice interactions play in communicating emotions, vice versa. Yeah, I've even seen, uh, you know, like I listen to a lot of audio books, and I can tell you. Um, Someone that has a good voice and speaks well makes me like the book. 
but no matter how interesting the book, if the person's boring or their voice is bad, I can't listen. Yeah. It's horrible. You know? And, um, exactly. You know, there's text to, yeah, there's text to speech engines, but it sounds like a robot. No one wants to really listen to a robot. So, you know, emotion is like completely intertwined with voice. So if you have voice with no emotion, it kind of falls flat. So I guess you must have both. And in order to read what someone's saying and not miss out on a lot of levels, you have to understand the emotion in the voice. Otherwise, you're going to miss out a lot or it can be totally misconstrued. Totally. So what you just said right now, like you said, nobody wants to talk to a robot. And the reason they're, they're being is, let's take an example. Um, you know, let's take Alexa, because everyone knows about Alexa or Cortana or DV for that matter. But Alexa, most people know. Um, after, after um, you know, tons of research, hundreds of millions of dollars spent into uh, building those Alexa-like interactions. Today, um, how does that interaction look like? So, for example, if I ask you a question and say, Richard, do you, would you like to do this? And you respond to me um, with a very sarcastic sure. I, I'm listening mm-hmm. to the word sure. I know what that means. Uh, but I'm also I'm getting the sarcasm. I'm listening to the tone. And I, I know you really don't mean that. And so my natural response would be, oh, maybe now is not a good time. right? And so how does that simple uh, one snippet interaction looks like today with Alexa. If Alexa asks you to do something and you respond back with that sarcasm, she has no clue. I mean, she responds back with, okay, great, let's do it. So, right. you know, and that's why people don't want to interact with robots or for that matter, in, in inanimate human systems because they are not relatable because emotions are what makes a human a human and a human conversation more relatable. And we today can make that happen possible it's today it's not it's not in research it's not something that we're working on that's going to be available five years from now we have that capability we're applying that capability into a variety of different uh specific business use cases and we can make alexa more emotionally aware which would mean that she'll be more relatable and that would mean we'll be able to talk to alexa more and uh, alexa would be more useful and so i think that applies to any human to machine interaction, or I should say not necessarily machine, but inanimate system interaction. It could be Alexa Google like system, or it could be a robot, which is a caregiver robot inside your home, uh, you know, uh, trained to uh, look after seniors, or it could be a retail assistant, or it could be uh, a virtualized uh, ordering kiosk at McDonald's where you speak to it and it understands your order and suggests you other, uh, other, uh, other options. Any system that you're interacting with through voice, which is not a human, would need a capability to be more human-like. Hmm. So what? Uh, how would this work? How would you program into an AI system the ability to recognize emotions? I mean, you know, are there are certain numbers of emotions that you would handle at first, or it's probably infinite ones and intonations and stresses and accents and things like that. So it seems like a hard thing to quantify. Yeah, so... Um, so, you know, our, our core capabilities uh, can be sort of uh, roughly put in three buckets. Um, the, the, the most, uh, I guess, uh, the most obvious aspects of it is a tenant of essentials of speech synthesis, which is, you know, there's a conversation that's happening, trying to figure out who's speaking when, who's speaking fast, who's speaking slow, who's uh, cutting someone off, um, speech overlap, uh, you know, the speech and listening ratios, gaps, et cetera, et cetera, even gender, right? And all those are the aspects of uh, interactions and speech synthesis. Now, the other aspect is uh, the what part, which is what is being said. So you're saying something, can I actually translate that into uh, actual words? And that's where the NLP comes into play and we have our own homegrown NLP that, uh, that we build to fine tune towards this capability. But our core offering, our, um, you know, secret sauce is the how part, which is how it is being said. So that's where we, we cue into a variety of different behavioral and emotional signals, such as arousal, politeness, uh, anger, happiness, sadness, agitation, um, empathy, rapport, engagement, and all of those things we cue on and we, we look at those emotions, we look at behaviors, of behavioral signals emerging from those emotions, and we even go as far as predict intent. That's actually one of our uh, key offerings is our intent prediction engine. We can predict 
with a very high level of accuracy if that holder is going to pay the debts or not pay. They're saying something, but do they, do they really mean it? Uh, or if you are in a conversation with uh, a client who you're trying to sell something, uh, we can predict if the person's going to buy or not going to buy. And so the propensity to pay and the propensity to buy uh, prediction uh, prediction questions. So we could do all of that. And that's, those, those are the different things we do. Um, and those are the different things we offer. Now, how do we do that? Um, you know, a years of research. Uh, the tech uh, is found, founded out of USC, where um, a lot of research has been done. That's where our founders worked and researched uh, from the sale lab and the behavioral lab. We um, focus primarily on intonations, so it's somewhat language agnostic, uh, but it's a combination of a, uh, linguistics and intonations. But vast majority of our focus is in intonations, which is the emphasis on words and how certain things are being said. Um, and so as a result, the capabilities are largely uh, portable to any language, um, you know, accent agnostics, et cetera. So what's an interaction look like? Do you have any models set up or you know, how far along is this uh, project? Yeah, we, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, a variety of capabilities uh, in place today commercially. Our core offering can be thought of as a vertical agnostic platform offering. So think of ourselves as a TensorFlow-like offering on top of which other capabilities and specific products can be built. We, we sell into a variety of different verticals, so uh, like inside sales, the contact centers, BPOs. There we go after traditional KPIs such as propensity to pay and buy, customer satisfaction, call success, agent customer matching, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when we apply the tech into health tech, so if, uh, we have a client using our, our technology and they deal with a platform that manages patients with depression. So they use the technology to predict the propensity for suicidal behavior. Very different use case than say, managing agent engagement or matching the right agent with the right customer. Um, now, you know, you, we also, uh, we talked about these use cases. We also apply the technology into uh, virtual assistants and robots. So we're working with uh, a few, a uh, few players that are building social robots or companion robots. And our goal there is to make that robot more, uh, more empathetic, uh, and more emotionally aware. And at the end, be more useful and be more relatable. So, all those use cases uh, we apply uh, into uh, today. I mean, those are the, the different uh, engagements that we have with various customers at this point. So what has been the, um, have you been able to get really good fidelity on emotions and voice? Does it depend on the person's emotional state or the context? Like what are some of the details that make this either easy to do or incredibly difficult to do? It is very hard. Uh, this is not an easy sign. Uh, this is, Certainly, uh, work in progress in terms of applying that. So, like, I mean, if you think about it, applying emotion recognition science to um, a conversation that is in a specific domain where the context is largely contained and understood, which, like, for example, an agent uh, customer conversation uh, or maybe a conversation between a debt collector and debt holder where the calls are high quality, uh, properly recorded, uh, or uh, being assembled uh, with, with professional uh, equipment, and uh, you have uh, proper annotations and labeling in place, uh, you get a very, very high level of accuracy. Now, when you say that, could you generally just sense emotions uh, of a random conversation happening in a cafeteria? That's very hard. There's a lot, there's a lot of noise tenants to it because you're focusing on intonations and, but you're getting a lot of false alert. So that's, those are the things which are sort of more for, of a stretch goal for us, which is, can we eventually apply the capabilities into, uh, general conversational AI? Uh, there, those are, those are the areas which we are researching on. Those are the of noise, uh, you know, signal reduction and other aspects of, uh, working with um, data that is that may, may not be optimal or may, may not be super high quality. Those are the, those are the things which uh, are sort of more in the future. But a lot of these other uh, conversations, a lot of these other uh, interactions in, in a business setting, um, the, we're able to achieve a, a fairly good level of accuracy. Uh, definitely 
adequate enough for businesses to uh, build specific uh, value propositions on. So there, um, so what would happen in an interaction with customer service person if you could hear the uh, person calling in is getting frustrated, you know, or if they're getting angry, if they're, uh, I don't, yeah, I guess frustrated or angry, would you try to help that person differently or did some systems be used to kind of, I don't know, I guess punish someone, let's say if they're cursed or if they're really angry I and mean, I can see this going both ways. Yeah, so you know those uh, those actions are obviously uh, driven and determined by uh, the specific uh, business uh, context and business use cases uh, that a customer is aiming to go after or solve for. Now, um, like for example, here, here's a here's a specific offering that that speaks to what the use case you just said, which is. Um, uh, sort of an agent helper or a real-time uh, notification engine. So it's imagine a scenario where an agent speaking with a client, and um, it's a live call. And this this engine is running in the back. Our uh, emotion AI engine is running in the back, listening to the conversation and processing the conversation real time, parsing it uh, from an NLP aspect, but also parsing it from a diarizationization. Perspective, which is who's speaking when, and and deducing signals and all kinds of emotions and behavioral signals. And so it's it's projecting to the user. Uh, imagine a notification that pops up on the agent's dashboard and say, "Hey, speak faster, or speak slower, or you sound angry, or the client sounds angry." And those are those are the signals uh, that are chosen to be presented to the to the agent based on where the partner solution uh, is uh, feels is valuable and how the agent reacts to it. It obviously depends on you know what outcome you're trying to achieve. So, but when you're looking at very specific uh, prediction questions like propensity to pay or propensity to buy, you're looking at a scenario where you uh, you have you have the engine analyze the conversation, you control the conversation as an agent. And uh, at the end of the conversation, when you feel you're, you're ready to wrap up, you, you ask the engine to process it and engine processes it real time and comes back with an assessment. It's a binary question. Is this person going to pay or not going to pay? Because once I know, and we can predict that with over 82% accuracy, once I know as an agent, if this person is not going to pay, then I don't have to continue to work on that account. I could potentially, you know, sell that deal to maybe a third-party agent or a third-party company for, for the debt collection. Uh, or if I get the signal that person's going to pay, then maybe I'll try out other means uh, to, uh, you know, extract that payment. And the similar situations for propensity to buy. And so I'm saying those situations, those actions are really driven by the specific business context. And now we we don't build those products. We we build the engines. We work with partners who are specifically building call center platforms, and they're specifically building debt collection uh, agent platforms. And again, you know, on the health tech side, there are people who are the companies who are building specific platforms that cater to the specific audience. We're sort of behind the scenes. We're the engine that gets absorbed inside their overall platform offering, working behind the scenes to analyze emotions. Does that make sense? So you're saying that using the emotional, I'll just call it a meter, you know, for lack of a, a crude word, but you're trying to answer the question, let's say in a debt collection call, will they pay or not pay? And if it goes to the scale where it looks like the person is not going to pay because of what they're saying in the emotional content, then what would happen with that call? You know, would you try to rescue it or is it just referred to a third party debt collector or what would happen for instance? Yeah, it's exactly all those all those options and possibilities uh, are then now available to to that company and to that to that debt collection agent uh, to be more specific in terms of how to react to this learning, which was not possible earlier. Because right? previously you'd follow like typical companies would follow a process of um, trying to uh, trying to navigate conversations up to a certain period of time. And then beyond that period of time, you would just blindly uh, do the cutoff and hand hand those hand those uh, accounts to somebody else. Now, uh, if you are if you have the ability to predict future and you know or predict intent, then then you would react differently. Now, um, now the the point I was trying to make earlier is like you know even in that uh, agent notification engine. Uh, what you do with those learnings, which is you just discovered that as soon as I mentioned price, uh, the client's um, you know responses turned to be completely disengaged, 
or maybe even angry. Um, then you have an ability to react to it in a certain way in order to salvage that deal. But we don't necessarily make those decisions. Like uh, we were, our our core is to offer those capabilities in terms of what you do with those capabilities and how you build that into your experience would be would be uh, sort of dependent on the platform providers that we work with, uh, or basically our clients and our customers. So if you have an agent, you wouldn't have to listen to all their calls to know that this agent, for some reason, is getting 35% anger responses and has a low collection rate, and this agent has only 20% negative and has a much higher collection rate. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, that's actually another uh, core offering uh, which uh, we work towards, which is what we call an audit engine. And so, like, so today, actually, so what, what you're referring to is a mega use case. And so, for example, if you think about it, you, you've been on a call with a bank or an insurance company, for that matter, any company where you've been on a call with a customer service agent, and that call has been is being recorded because you get that message. The question is, what happens to the recorded calls? Is hundreds of thousands of calls those are being recorded for for the purposes of compliance uh, and adherence? What happens to it? Now, typically, there's a, there's an audit. Uh, there's an audit to monitor compliance, but that audit is entirely random. So you have someone picking out a random set of calls uh, from a certain department or, or a certain group of people and have uh, someone listen to, through those calls to, uh, to monitor compliance and adherence and uh, you know, to see if the, the job's being done right or the agent's been trained properly. Now, uh, with a technology like ours, what you could do is you could have every call that gets recorded be uh, analyzed and parsed and categorized for a lack of simplicity uh, as a red call or a green call, red call being problematic and green call being really good. Now you could you could sort that based on departments. You could sort that based on agents. You can find agents with the most red calls. You can find agents with the most green calls. And eventually you could pick certain calls with certain people in certain departments um, and deep dive into it to analyze why those calls are red or green and have a much more advanced, much more sophisticated audit process, which is a game changer and a huge competitive edge for a for a financial company or for that matter any company that requires a regulation. And so that's those are the capabilities we can make possible, um, and uh, certainly uh, they're available today. Yeah, what percentage of calls uh, do you think are actually monitored or looked at or used for analytics in a call center? I know it varies, but ballpark. You know, I don't really know the actual percentage, uh, but uh, I have to say it's a very, very small percentage, just simply because it's a manual task. It's a random, it's more of a, a stick approach uh, than a carrot approach. And so it's just, you know, uh, there's a chance that your call can be monitored. But the fact that uh, the fact that an agent is talking to hundreds of clients a day and there are hundreds and thousands of agents online from a typical call center, um, the, the percentage of the calls that actually get monitored is very low. Now, over the years, um, there, there have been other technologies in play, especially around the NLP and the linguistic side, where um, you're, you're parsing uh, the conversation into the actual words, and you're looking for certain keywords uh, that uh, shouldn't be said. And you're queuing in for curse words and queuing in for certain other specific keywords, like, hey, did you ask for your social, you ask for social security where you shouldn't have asked for it? And, and those triggers and those alerts that come into place, but it's still, still half-bay, it's still inadequate. Uh, what you don't get is, um, you know, if that call was a, a really good call from an engagement perspective, and what, if, if it's not, then what happened? What led to it? Um, NLP doesn't catch that. It, it's just simply going to catch for certain specific keywords. So the actual calls that get analyzed for really good training metrics, uh, is very low, I'd say maybe in single digits, uh, but then I'd be guessing. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I can see a lot could be gleaned from this. You know, if you're using um, non-native speakers, um, evaluating their efficacy to see if it's, uh, you know, if it's helping you or hurting you. You know, maybe it's uh, they're, they're lower cost, but, you know, the collection rate is bottomed out ever since you started using them, for instance. I mean, I guess there's a lot uh, hidden in the world of voice and emotions that you're talking about uncovering. A lot. I mean, uh, let me give you an example. Some of my favorite examples because it made a profound impression on me. When I was looking at this technology, uh, I was looking at uh, certain calls, uh, which uh, were sort of categorized as red and green. And I was curious to see 
okay, what, what kind of uh, learnings can you make from that? So I just randomly picked a, a call that was uh, marked as a red call, and I uh, listened to some of the conversations, aspects of the conversation. So it was essentially a conversation between um, an agent, uh, a young agent, uh, someone very new on the job, and she, you know, and she was recently trained, and a client that was a very happy client. So the client actually called them to uh, communicate that uh, they're um, they're very happy with the business and they're doing a lot of uh, repeated work, uh, but they have to pay periodically using credit card every time they order service. And they were hoping that a recurring billing could be set up because they don't have enough credit cards in the company. And, you know, so it's a happy call because here's a client calling in, uh, you know, satisfied and wanting to do more. Now, the agent, if you listen to that call, uh, does everything right. I mean, she says the right things. Uh, she's very polite. Uh, but there's obvious that something's happening there because uh, she is completely, you know, uh, disengaged. And she's just not emotionally there. And maybe it was a personal thing or whatever happened. But you could see how she brought the mood down uh, of the client eventually. And that call didn't end well. And the client, in fact, is trying hard to uh, ramp up the emotion. But then the person all again breaks it down. And so he, and I was curious to see what happened in the call. So I sort of we looked into that and we realized that uh, that agent left. Uh, about four to five weeks after um, I left the job, after thousands of dollars had been spent on her training and she just left the job. So those are the things which uh, are impossible to catch unless you have a capability like what we deliver to, because you, you simply can't, and you can't catch it unless you're listening to every call. And uh, the impact on the business, not only by impacting a paying client, but also by uh, losing a resource which you're putting so much money to hire and train, and then losing it, you could have salvaged that situation. If the call was uh, analyzed and it was triggered, and that agent was uh, reached out to and trained uh, and and approached, you know, those those are the things which you can absolutely do and absolutely solve for. Yeah, that's interesting. I've I've been on you know unfortunately <laughs> many customer service. You've calls. been on a lot of calls. <laughs> but, well, I know. I mean, even customer service calls. You know, I have to call and yeah. my bank or I have to, wherever. And if the person doesn't care and you can hear it, it, it's frustrating. It makes you not want to talk to them, you know. Obviously, if they can't understand what you're saying, if they don't speak English well, for me, that's frustrating. But if they don't care, it makes me really angry. And I really don't like that, especially yeah. if I'm having a problem with the account. And I just, totally. you know, I want to talk to my manager. Or, and, you know, what if you have a customer service person that's having a really bad day and they take it out on callers? Or what if you see their, you know, their... um emotional scoring is trending downwards that could point out something's wrong with them in their personal life. Maybe you can intervene in a positive way. Hey, we noticed that your calls are getting uh, more and more hostile for some reason. What's going on? How do we fix this? I mean, so there's a lot. I guess there's more than I can even imagine is involved. There is, there is a lot that can uh, can be achieved uh, with these capabilities. And, and that's, just, that's just in the, the contact center BPO world. Right. And imagine the possibilities in robotics, in virtual assistants, in health tech. Imagine if you're able to predict um, a propensity for suicidal behavior. What will the impact for that be? And imagine, imagine a toy that uh, understands the emotional state of mind of the child and reacts accordingly and what, what that potential interaction could look like. Right, so possibilities are endless, right? So we're 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 pushing uh, certain pilots uh, around smart home, where you walk in and certainly, you know, you have the ability to uh, be motion sensed and the lights go on due to based on a certain time. But can your mood be sensed? And if your mood is sensed, then can the lighting be adjusted or you know a certain song can be recommended based on that? So it's just it's the endless possibilities are all queuing around, all circling around the emotional state of mind, which is a big part of us being human. Yeah, you need one for when you come home and you know your, your wife's mad at you and you don't know why. You need to be able to whisper to it, oh, what's going <laughs> on? Yeah, maybe that's a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, last couple of questions. What, are there any uh, stretch applications or programs that you think would be really amazing if you could get it to work? You know, maybe they're being piloted, maybe not. But what are some of the, uh, you know, as you've, you've probably thought about this a lot more than most, but 
what are some of the most exciting possibilities you've conceived in this arena that you'd like to accomplish? I think um, the exciting, exciting possibilities are around, um, I mean, I, I have to first say that um, all of these cases, all these sorry, use cases and KPIs that we um, deal with today and deliver to, towards today are exciting for us. And they're exciting because they solve a real business problem. They make an impact, they add value, they provide a competitive edge, and they make life better. And, um, you know, for all of those reasons, uh, they're very exciting for us. Now, the things which are sort of more, you know, towards the horizon is the stuff which I was talking about earlier, which is ability to deliver um, that read on the emotional state or the behavioral state or predict intent from a generalized, non-domain specific uh, conversation interaction. And that opens up a whole new set of possibilities. But I also like to, you know, see um, our machine interactions become more empathetic. And so I'd love to see uh, Alexa understand emotions when I'm saying something to her. I think that would be fabulous for Alexa to do, or for that matter, Cortana or Google. And, you know, I'd love to have um, other physical robot interactions be more human-like. And I think that would be a fantastic, uh, you know, experience to have in you know, for a lot of people, seniors, for example, um, I've been, you know, I've been looking into that space because I find uh, that whole, you know, the opportunity around investing in the senior management space fascinating. And one of the th- one of the learnings I've had from that space is that one of the big challenges seniors have is one of the biggest challenges they have is loneliness. They just need somebody to talk to, and they. They need somebody to care for them, true, but for the most part, they just want to talk to someone. And if you imagine there's a, the, the, you could solve that through uh, some of these capabilities. You can, you can build a senior assistant device where, you know, the, that device is not only be able to understand you from the words, but also your emotional state of mind. I mean, that, that would be, uh, that would be quite fascinating. And I, yeah. and I think it's very possible. It's not that far out. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I've noticed is, um, I don't know what it was. This is one place I call and I, I always say like, speak to an agent because I don't want to go through the automated stuff. And the automated voice goes, okay, I'll connect you to an agent. And I, it, it sounds to me as if the automated thing is saying, all right, I'll connect, you know, and even though I know it's automated, I still respond to it because of the emotion it seems like it gave me. So it's weird that, you know, once these AI systems do display emotions, I know people will react to them even if they don't want to, because they're just so programmed to react to the emotion in some, someone's voice or something's voice. Absolutely. Um, and this is definitely something, you know, which, uh, you know, it's like some, someone mentioned to me that, you know, why is it that people always are, are generally so rude to voice assistants? Um, they won't talk to their kids like that, or they won't talk to, uh, you know, even other people like that. But most people and most conversations with virtual assistants are very unnatural. I mean, people yell or rude, and they're very yep. abrupt. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's just it's because you know you don't relate, uh, you don't think that's one of us. And but imagine, I mean, your your example. Imagine if uh, that response back is more emotionally uh, relevant and aware. Um, you'd, you'd react differently. Right, I would. Yeah, totally. I can feel myself yeah. influenced by it. Whether I want to be or not, I can't help it, is what I've noticed. So I can see why emotions, the right ones, would really help, even if it comes from a machine. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, it's been a good call. What's, um, what's the best way for people that are interested to follow up and get in touch? You know, any website references or, you know, social media? How should people uh, follow up if they're interested? Yeah, um, there's a few different ways. Uh, you could definitely track what we do at our web page, which is behavioralsignals.com, which is B-E-H-A-V-I-O-R-A-L signals.com. You could also uh, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, my web page is uh, my first and the last name, R-A-N-A-G-U-J-R-A-L.com. And, um, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to, um, see uh, how this conversation has triggered uh, certain ideas in people. I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to ideate out loud. So reach out to me, send me a message on Twitter. 
um, or um, you know on my vet page, and I'd love to uh, love to open up a conversation. Well, very good, Marana. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it. Bye. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.